Hi, my name is Megan, and today I would like to talk about simplifying testing of Spark applications. The reason why I wanted to do this talk today is because recently I've coded or I've learned more about testing and um, about PySpark recently, um, and I've also learned about the usefulness of testing. Um, but when you put them together, um, testing and Spark leads to a couple of difficulties, which is why I want to go over. So a little bit about the uh, about myself and my co-speaker. I'm currently a data scientist at Spotify, and I've coded in mostly PySpark, Python, and a little bit of R in most of my career. I've built recommender systems and deployed machine learning features. I've also designed A-B testing experiments and contrib contribute frequently to my workplace's internal data science tooling. Han, on the other hand, is a staff machine learning engineer at Lyft, and he's also the author of Fugue, which is the package that I would love to introduce in this presentation. So how did I come to know Spark? Spark allows you to work with very large data sets. And so Spark became a very natural tool for the companies I work for due to its great ability to scale feature engineering tasks, perform model training and scoring decently fast as well. Spark is also open source and they have an active mailing list and uh, JIRA for issue tracking. And it has a really active community and you'll find lots of contributors to Spark from Apple and IBM and even global contributors as well. So I work mostly, I mostly work with PySpark and PySpark allows you to write Spark applications using Python APIs. PySpark supports most of Spark's features such as Spark SQL, DataFrame, Streaming, MLlib, and Spark Core. Um, and the reason for this API is because Spark is written in Scala and its source code can be compiled to Java bytecode and it has to be ran on the Java virtual machine. So the main takeaway is that when running PySpark code, it's actually not Python native, um, and it, as it's actually just an API just to run Scala code on the JVM. So, and that might face a, a bit of a problem for data science applications, as most of us most of us like to write in Python, and uh, most data science teams are familiar with lots of Python libraries, uh, with pandas being the most familiar. And as you can see from this chart. Um, this shows the percentage of Stack Overflow questions tagged um, to pandas being relatively higher than the other Python packages. Um, and, you know, the reason why people are um, really like, um, and, and also pandas is, is, you know, a really great open source um, package as well. It has great documentation, um, good functionality, and also a great uh, community of people who have fixed many problems that you've faced. Um, and, and that goes, and it's the same for a lot of kind of Python um, based uh, open source packages, such as NumPy, Stacks Model, and Scikit-Learn as well. Um, and it's become very popular and a mainstream type of tool for a lot of data, data scientists. So running Python versus um, Spark applications. When it comes to maintaining both Python and Spark logic in your code base, Python meaning it needs to run on the Python interpreter and Spark meaning it needs to run on the JVM. Um, it's good to think about what kind of data you need to test with and what kind of logic you need to run with. And it's also good to think about what kinds of tests you want to run. So are you ingesting you know, a large amount of data from your data lake where it's mostly Spark data frames and are you running an end-to-end -end kind of integration test at that point? Um, or are you running kind of small modular unit tests using say pandas mock data frames? Or are you running a bunch of data validations with your production data prior to running your production pipelines? Um, all of those things are things you wanna kind of think about when you're um, figuring out what kinds of tests you wanna write and um, what kind of logic you wanna write your tests with, um, how you wanna um, make sure that those um, different, I guess, requirements are kind of satisfied um, so that your data scientist can contribute very uh, openly and freely without, um, with the confidence of uh, knowing that if they edit a certain part of the code, things would break and also make sure that, you know, um, the whole testing um, kind of um, philosophy is kind of, uh, and, and culture is kind of kept in, uh, in, in, um, in check in terms of like speed and, and, and whatnot. So uh, you have to think about all of those things. Um, and I know it's a lot <laughs> to think about. Um, so let's say we break it down to four scenarios. On the columns, you have the type of uh, logic that you want to support um, and the reason why you want to write tests for. Um, and on the um, 
sorry, on the columns, you have the type of data that you're ingesting. And on the rows, you have the type of logic that you want to process that data with. So on the top left, um, this is the easiest to do, and this is where you want to be. Um, everything runs on, Python, on the Python interpreter. There's no cluster spin up. Uh, Pandas data frames are processed by Python, and these tests can run on the Python interpreter, no problem at all. Um, they're going to be quick, and your data scientists are going to be able to iterate really quickly. And then on the top right, I would say this is also a very common scenario, given that a lot of companies um, you know, adopted already a data lake like HDFS or DBFS and um, have like maybe their own Spark servers. So the logic that you write has to be in PySpark or Scala, et cetera. Um, but you naturally have people um, kind of being on the team and kind of being part of the data science community and knowing that they, and, and wanting to write in Python. So um, unfortunately for this, um, in order to, I guess, um, cater to the needs of some of the people on your team who write frequently in Python, um, they would have to find a way to convert um, um, the Spark data frames, which your company already has um, available in HDFS or DBFS um, to pandas um, so that they can run their logic with, run their uh, Python logic with those uh, data frames. And it can be really expensive um, either during test time or production time. So what some people do is kind of the converse where they wrap their Python logic within a UDF into a UDF so that they can run those Python functions on the Spark JVM. Um, and it, it makes so much more sense in terms of like um, kind of data conversions and whatnot. Um, but I, I'm going to kind of talk about some of the um, pitfalls and, and uh, of the Python UDFs and also about some of the confusion that it led in the community and um, some, uh, I guess, pain points when it comes to testing. Um, so on the bottom left, this quadrant doesn't really make sense, but it kind of makes sense um, in terms of you know, you want to have like a pandas mock data frame and you want to process um, uh, and the, the logic to process that could be in Spark because um, usually when you have Spark data frames in a very small um, size, um, it actually takes longer to run in, in terms of compute time if you have your Spark logic process it as a Spark data frame. So what some people do is actually have a pandas data frame instead um, as their underlying data and still use that Spark logic to process that. And in this case, you would still have to spin up a cluster um, because one, you, ha you have Spark logic that needs to run on the JVM. And what happens is that um, when you um, convert, and, and also you would have to run into the expensive conversion of that uh, Spark data frame to Pandas, but actually not too, too bad because it's a very small data frame, but still you run into that conversion as well. Um, on the bottom right, it's also pretty easy to do because you know we have Spark, we have Spark, um, it's uh, all you have to do is kind of spin up a cluster and you can spin up the local cluster. You don't have to spin up like a remote cluster or whatnot. Um, and you can kind of uh, run your PySpark data frames together with your PySpark logic. And ideally, um, based on all four of these scenarios, you actually want to go closer to the top left quadrant, as close as possible to the top left quadrant um, from the perspective of testing um, and um, because you don't have to do cluster spin-ups and there's not much, um, I, I would say like uh, data frame conversions in that case. Um, and and it makes so much sense because if most of your developers are um, writing in Python, it, it makes so much sense to kind of keep everything as Python native as possible. Okay, so I wanna circle back to the Spark and Pandas UDFs that I kind of talked about that uh, a lot of people um, might do in terms of trying to process their Spark data frames using Python logic. And actually UDFs, um, uh, uh, well, Apache Spark, um, the Apache Spark project is also highly aware of the popularity of Python and the demand for Spark users to want to run their Python logic on Spark. So they came up with the UDF. And the UDF I'm talking about here is specifically the PySpark UDF. Um, and the UDF stands for User Defined Function. And prior to Spark 2.3, the PySpark UDF was one of the ways that enabled users to run their Python logic on Spark so as to extend Py PySpark functionality. And it's totally reasonable to want to do that because um, you know, at that point of time, maybe there's some certain functionality that didn't exist um, at, at that point of time. So maybe writing in Python was one of the ways to kind of extend that. Or, um, or it could also be that you know Python was just a little bit more readable um, than writing in um, kind of PySpark logic. Um, for example, like parsing an ID 
in, and then storing it in a key value pair and any complex data wrangling really, um, like regex reading sometimes could also be more readable in Python as well. So um, Spark is not able to translate that Python code from the UDF to JVM instructions. And Python uh, and the Python UDF has to be executed on the Python worker. So um, unlike the rest of the Spark job, which is executed on the JVM, while the vanilla Python UDF uh, with the uh, sorry with the vanilla Python UDF, this transfer is realized by converting the data to pickled bytes and then sending it to Python, which is not very efficient and has quite a big memory footprint. And over time, this process becomes expensive, especially because since this operation is done one row at a time. And in Spark 2.3, Spark released the pandas UDF. Um, so as you can see on the left here, um, I'm kind of um, kind of comparing those things um, where um, in three of these kind of um, different kinds of functions, um, we, we see a better performance in the pandas UDF compared to the row at a time kind of vanilla PySpark UDF. And um, the reason for this improvement in um, performance is because there, uh, all this kind of serialization is being executed by Apache Arrow to exchange data directly between the JVM and, Py and the Python driver executors with near zero deserialization um, and, and deserialization from Python to JVM. So um, here that benchmark is taken actually from the Databricks blog and these three different functions um, uh, the pandas plus one. Um, this one is a, a cumulative um, uh, distribution uh, function, um, a statistical cumulative distribution function that is using SciPy. And the last one is a uh, pandas um, uh, function um, to subtract the mean from every one of these kind of values in a column. And you can see that the greatest savings that we have here is the CDF function, which makes sense because it's actually a SciPy function. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say here is that the pandas UDF really was improved on um, by Apache Spark from 2. Point, Spark 2.3 onwards. But um, using the pandas UDF can be confusing. Um, in this simple case where you would like to, it's a kind of arbitrary function where you want to add one to a column, you could use any of these three ways to give you the same outcome. However, each of these pandas UDFs expects different inputs and output types, and it works in a very different way with a distinct semantic and um, different kinds of performances as well. Um, it confuses users about which one to use and learn and how each works. So for example, in the top two, you, you can see that this pandas UDF can be used in, with the Spark um, uh, select or with column uh, statements, but then it kind of fails when it comes to the group by. Um, but then if you wanted to use the group by function and still apply that same kind of arbitrary type function, you'll have to revert to like kind of the third um, function definition. Um, and even this is kind of confusing because you try to apply the group by in, in this third case and it fails. And, um, and actually you don't need to pass in even the ID. It, it kind of takes in, it, it kind of knows like which, um, uh, I guess, uh, column to, to group by on. So it can be a bit confusing to know which one to use and how to use them. Okay, so, um, and the pandas UDFs got better. They even accept um, series and pandas uh, type hints now. Um, so for example, on the left, those were the three kind of ways to write that. and. Um, on the right, it got a little bit better because you don't need to kind of figure out what kind of UDF type I need to um, kind of cast my um, output types as um, because it could just be a pandas type. And a lot of people are aware of like what a pandas series is. It's like a one column type of, um, uh, it's like one column from a data frame. Um, people know what an iterator is. Um, it's an object that applies, you know, um, different functions to um, something that you can iterate over. Um, and in the last case, you can even um, type hint a data frame itself. So it become, became quite useful um, in terms, and, and it's good in terms of testing because in one part of the test is, is figuring out what kinds of um, uh, data types um, uh, your, your objects are. Um, and even testing undecorated UDFs are easier. So as you can see in this top here, um, we have a function that was decorated using a pandas UDF decorator. 
Um, but what you can actually do is you can um, obviously unrack it and kind of um, write it on a separate line. And you can very easily kind of write a, a test function for the undecorated um, um, function. You can also do the same with the decorated version, but you might have to read a little bit of source code to kind of figure out how to get to the um, initial kind of function. Um, but you can very easily kind of do something like this as well. Um, and I would say even the functional API is not better. Um, so in this case, this is, you don't even have to decorate this function. Um, it can, you know, take on an iterator and pandas. Uh, it has to be an iterator because it's a map in pandas um, a functional API. Um, but even so, this function remains totally um, Python native and you can test this um, very easily. Um, but I would say there's still one more um, kind of troublesome thing that you have to do, even though you have this amazing functional API, which is to actually write um, a test for that additional portion. Um, you actually need to have this as it has to be a uh, Spark data frame that it's accepting because the functional API map in pandas is for a Spark data frame. So in this case, we have, um, let's say, a, some sort of predict function um, using some sort of model path you unpickle the model and you wanna score um, the data frame um, and get some sort of propensity scores from them. Um, this function in this case is a pandas um, Python native function. But in this case, in the second function, um, this run predict function is actually accepting a Spark data frame. Um, and um, it's also, um, yeah, and it's using the map in pandas uh, function, which means that if you wanted to test if you were to write a um, unit test for these, this um, script, you would actually be writing two unit tests. And on top of that, you would still have to spin up a Spark cluster because of your second function. So um, so yeah, um, I think that kind of, um, is, is this is where I'm going to start to introduce a little bit of fugue. And compared to this portion here, everything is kind of uh, Python native. And the input data frame here can be anything you want. It could be, um, it could be a uh, pandas data frame. It could be a Spark data frame. It really depends on what kind of engine that you want to run it with. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in my demo. Um, one final note before I move on to Fugue is that I, I also see a, a bunch of companies also on Databricks, and and I absolutely love Databricks. I, I think it's um, it's it's founded by the original uh, creators of Spark, um, and um, it allows users to spin up their own Spark cl clusters at a click of a button. They also offer a tool called Databricks Connect, which is a client library for Databricks runtime. And it allows you to write jobs using Spark APIs and run them remotely on the Databricks cluster. Um, so this is really useful for developers like me who like to prototype their code locally in an IDE or um, in, an, in some sort of IDE, um, but still execute my code um, remotely um, as if I'm kind of executing it locally, which is really, really nice in terms of a developer experience. However, a downside of this is that it actually hijacks your PySpark um, installation. So when you, um, when you download uh, Databricks Connect, one of the first things you have to do is actually uninstall PySpark. And the reason for that is because um, Databricks Connect actually uh, interacts with the driver um, of the cluster remotely. And it also receives instructions um, to send to the driver node locally so it kind of um it needs to kind of uh, hijack your pie spark because you're no longer able to spin up a local cluster it has to spin up a cluster on databricks um for the ease of uh developers to actually execute their code remotely and that that, that is the purpose of the client uh, tool um it is a, a bit of a downside when it comes to uh, wanting to iterate quickly and uh, and do testing quickly um, because you no longer have to spin up or you know you no longer are able to spin up a local spark cluster which takes seconds and instead you have to spin up a remote cluster which could take five to ten minutes um, and it 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 could um, it could kind of um, slow down the uh, development time for developers like me so one way we can test quickly quickly with native python or pandas but execute spark only when needed is through fugue and Fugue is an abstraction layer that keeps your code and computation native to Python, yet easily portable to Spark clusters. Developers that use Fugue benefit from more rapid iterations in their data projects. And I will now go over a demo using a Kaggle dataset for feature engineering um, within the problem of uh, toxic comment classification. 
I will now go over a Kaggle data set that contains a large number of Wikipedia comments, which have been labeled by human raters for toxic behavior. Competitors were given this data set to process to determine if a comment's type of toxicity labels contained toxic, obscene, or threatening types of toxicity. And they could have, and each of the comments could have more than one label, which is why it's more of a multi-label problem. In both of my notebooks that I will show, I will go through a tokenizing task using Map and Pandas and also how to do this in Fugue as well. It's a very basic feature engineering task that many NLP pipelines would do as they would have to use individual words or tokens from the comments or long strings of text to com compute TFIDF or embedding lookups or do embedding lookups. So in this first notebook, I read in the um, Kaggle dataset using pandas, and I just output an example of how that comment were to look like. And then I also have to spin up a Spark session um, in a Spark context um, in order to uh, process the uh, comments as a Spark data frame using map and pandas function, because the map and pandas function only works with Spark data frame, so you need a Spark session. Um, and then over here, I this is kind of the meat of the um, of the tokenizing task. Um, first, I actually um, uh, convert all of the comments into lowercase. And then I also remove any punctuation and split the um, sentences by, um, um, or I split the words by um, spaces and new line characters. And I also uh, remove any non-ASCII words or characters. And I also remove any stop words and I use that, um, and I use the NLTK corpus in order to um, get those stop words. And finally, I assign that list of words to a new uh, column in the data frame as comment tokens. Now the map and pandas function requires an iterator input and output. So I had to kind of wrap this function into an iterator format. And finally, in order to process my Spark data frame, um, I have to um, also provide the map and pandas function a schema. So um, this is very Spark specific context and I have to kind of do a bunch of type hints so that the map and pandas, um, so that Spark kind of knows what kind of schema to expect out as an output of this function. Finally, I um, uh, convert that uh, data frame, pandas data frame into a Spark data frame. Um, and then I uh, apply my SDF tokenize, my Spark uh, tokenize function uh, to the Spark data frame and show in this case what the original comment is and the new lead comment, new comment tokens. And in this case, I, you can see that it has successfully done it where this was the original comment and the eventual kind of tokens extracted from comments. And in this case is another uh, kind of example of that successful tokenization happening. So I will now go through the same kind of process and the same kind of tokenizer function on, on how it would be done in Fugue. So um, in this case, I read in a training data. I, I read in my same thing. I read in the Kaggle data set using uh, pandas. I have the same kind of function over here. The only real difference is the schema component. Um, now, how uh, Fugue works is that it parses um, the schema input types and the output types. Um, sorry, the, so it parses um, what the tokenized function output is going to be like, so that if you run um, this function on Spark, it knows kind of what schema to expect as an output. Um, and same thing, remove punctuation, split on um, spaces, new line characters, remove non-ASCII, remove stop words, also using NLTK, and then finally assigning it into a new kind of um, column. And the cool thing about Spark, uh, the cool thing about Fugue is that I don't need to kind of wrap my function or um, mangle my function into a way that kind of fits the map and pandas kind of um, inputs and outputs. Um, it also can, um, I can also kind of run this and show that, um, so as you can see, if I run this, it will now output the uh, comment tokens. And in this case, I am also able to get the same kind of results that I got in the Spark case with the comments and the outputs of the, those tokens. 
um, and also uh, following a different example as well. And the cool thing about Fugue is that I can actually switch out the execution engines such that it can run on um, native Python. So if I were to run that and print that result, it will now give this to me in a pandas data frame. Um, I also wanted to kind of showcase the ease of adding new um, arguments. So let's say we wanted to now parameterize where the name of the comment uh, text column as input call. So our function will now have another kind of parameter called input call. And it will now be passed as a parameter Use that quote there and you could see that it very easily is able to use to add kind of new parameters and that would still work with Python and it would also still work with Spark. And one thing if I didn't drive home kind of this point earlier is that um, you actually don't need to spin up your Spark cluster unless you tell Fugue to do so. Um, and this makes testing really easy because one, you um, Fugue guarantees the consistency of operating on any execution engine, um, uh, no matter uh, where you run your code. So what happens is that you can test very easily using um, native Python, um, using the native execution engine. But when it comes time to production, you can most definitely switch to Spark in order to ingest data from your data lake. I will now kind of showcase how this would look like if you were to use, uh, if you were to input, uh, add another parameter into the map in pandas function. So how this would look like is obviously we would do the same thing here. Add that in here. Then map tokenize will now also require another argument, no problem here. And then another time I would have to add <laughs> another parameter. Um, we, we had to pass in a parameter in multiple places is because the map in pandas function can only take in really one parameter, which is the iterator pandas data frame. And it cannot take in the input call. So we would have to kind of pass in, you would have to kind of um, kind of uh, Frankenstein this a little bit by passing in the argument into the map tokenize um, inner kind of lambda function definition. And then finally, you have to pass this in to here, which in this case is the actual call. And you would see this would run. So the difference here um, with Fugue is that um, one, you don't have to kind of um, define so many functions, you can really just define that one. And from a testing perspective, it saves you from writing tests from two additional functions. Um, two, um, you don't have to do any cluster spin up unless you need to. Um, so in this case, this is still kind of a Python native function, but you still, in order to, to write the map in pandas function, um, you still have to kind of write a PySpark kind of test for this as well, thereby um, incurring a local cluster spin up. And third, if you want to add any arguments into your functions, you would have to do so in multiple places. Um, and as a developer, it's not that great of an experience in terms of figuring out where kind of all your un underlying kind of um, functions lie so that you know where to change them. So all in all, I think Fugue is a really great tool in order for a developer like myself um, to um, reduce any pain points in terms of testing and also um, kind of speed up um, my workflow and so that I can kind of focus on um, my Python code that I would like to write. So now I would like to pass the time to Han who would talk a little bit more about uh, Fugue SQL and how um, this could further um, increase pro uh, developer productivity in terms of um, making the testing experience for Spark applications and other types of applications a lot easier. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Han Wong. Now I'm going to talk about testing in Spark application development. Testing for big data problems, especially for a Spark application, is challenging. More testing can effectively reduce the risk of production. However, this is probably the only positive thing in this table. What I often see is that 
Spark tests can easily double the total CPU hours used in development. The larger scale, the more cost overhead you may encounter when you want to do thorough tests. Another pain point is that the tests themselves are hard to write. For example, how to test a complex SQL query getting data from Hive but running on Spark. In addition, people tend to use more Spark objects, such as schema, data frame, RDD. They make Spark code elegant and short, but they add more complexity and unnecessary dependency when testing the core logic that is not relevant to Spark. Of course, there are always solutions, but they need extra code and they add performance overhead. So testing the Spark applications can further slow down the iterations on big data problems, which are already slow. So ideally, more testing on Spark applications should be a totally positive thing. It should reduce the total cost of development if we can reduce the number of iterations while not adding much overhead to verify each iteration. It should accelerate development if the tests are simple to add and effective to catch bugs. To be more general, here is what we want to achieve. During exploration, we want to minimize ad hoc code. The code and test we write should be almost ready for production. For each unit test, we want to minimize the execution time. It will save both time and money. We want to achieve 100% unit test coverage in order to minimize the risks in production. This seems impossible for Spark applications, but I will demonstrate how to achieve it by using Fugue. The last but not the least, we should consider test-driven development. TDD lets you define the requirements as tests, and then you can write code to fulfill the requirements. It can effectively reduce the number of iterations in development. In order to achieve these goals, first of all, we must have a correct mindset. The biggest challenge of big data problems is not processing big data, but how to quickly reduce the scale. Downsampling is an extremely important technique that every data practitioner should keep in mind. It is useful for most use cases. If your logic cannot work on small data, why do you think it can work on big data? With sampling, you can iterate locally. It's not only faster, but all local development techniques can be used. For example, the exceptions will be more explicit, and you can also use debugger to find the logical issues. After a few iterations, you can apply the current logic on the big data to verify. But how can we switch easily between big and small data without code change? And how can small data not suffer from the tediousness and overhead of Spark? The answer is to totally decouple from Spark, code-wise and mindset-wise. In the past, we created our own computing logic to run locally using simple Python and SQL. But in order to scale out, we have to use certain distributed computing engines such as Spark. In order to use a certain engine, we normally have to adopt their API and interfaces, making our core logic convoluted and hard to maintain. So what if we create an adaption layer that can adapt to both user's code and different computing engines? With this design, since the core logic is written in simple ways, they are already easy to unit test. Plus, the adaption layer can let you use local execution engine and the mock data frames to run your data pipeline end-to-end -end without Spark. Now your entire pipeline becomes testable, and more importantly, you can use this approach to quickly iterate on your local box. Plus, your logic becomes framework agnostic and easy to migrate. This is the motivation of Fugue. It is to hide the complexity and inconsistency of different computing frameworks and provide a unified approach to do distributed computing and machine learning. Now let me start the demo. In this demo, I'm using the Kaggle dataset US Election 2020 tweets, a typical natural language processing problem to show you how to quickly iterate on big data problems on Jupyter Notebook with test-driven approach. 
all data has been loaded from Kaggle and converted to Parquet and saved into Google Cloud. Parquet files are in general smaller than CSV. So as you can see, we have about 16 files and half gig in total. Let's start. First of all, let's set up the notebook environment. Fugo is a package that helps set up the Fugue-friendly notebook environment for Kaggle users. It sets shortcuts to use Spark and Dask, and it also enables Fugue SQL highlights. Fugue SQL extends standard SQL with extra syntax to make it a full-blown language. It is easy to use and friendly for data exploration. Now let's use Fugue SQL and Spark to explore the source data. This notebook magic have SQL means this cell is Fugue SQL, and Spark means I want this Fugue SQL to run on Spark. As you can see, under two seconds, we get some sample data from the original data set. Our goal in this demo is to analyze the sentiment scores of each tweet, and then we want to get the overall sentiment of groups grouped by state uh, code and hashtag. We're going to tokenize the tweets and use both NLTK and text blob to score the sentiment. We have about 1.7 million tweets to process, so it's compute intensive. So the first thing we should do is dump sample the data set so that we can iterate locally. Again, we use Fuke to do this. So as you can see, we want to sample 0.01% of the data from the original data set deterministically, and then we want to yield this sample data set to notebook so that we can use in the next cells. Now let's print out all the sample tweets. Downsampling is such a simple and effective approach to save development time. And now we can forget about the Spark, Fugue, and distributed system. We can just focus on the core NLP problem. Now we need tokenization. Intuitively, we need to lower the text and also remove stop words. Let's write the text first. Of course, it will fail. And now, let's write the code to make it a pass. So as you can see, we use NLTK's uh, lemmatizer and the stop words to, to clean up the text and the break into words array. So is this enough? We need to figure out. And this is where the sample data starts to be useful. Let's run on the entire sample data and have a visual check. So we still see special characters and links. And, and also there are text inside brackets. We want to remove all of them. So first of all, let's write text uh, tests. So this is special character, links and the brackets. Let it fail. And then let's add the implementation. Okay, now it works. And let's do another round of visual check. So now everything looks okay. You can continue this type of iteration until you are satisfied. And after all these iterations, you get this tokenized function as well as its test. They are almost ready for production. After tokenization, we can uh, compute the sentiment scores. One nice advantage of test-driven development is that the test is also the requirement. You can write the requirement and then work on the implementation. Let's write the, uh, the requirement first. We want the output to contain Vader score and the text blob score. And we want their signs to align with our expected um, directions. And these two assertions assert that. And also for the tweets after tokenization, if they're empty, then we want the score to be nulls. Now let's write the implementation. Now all tests passed, and the row wise operation have all finished. Now let's work on the aggregation part. Let's 
Let's assume that this compute sentiment is a function that's applied to a group of data. And this group of data is grouped by the state code and hashtag. And we wanted to output a data frame containing only one row. And in this row, it contains the aggregated sentiment score. If the input scores of VEDA score and the text blob score are well distributed from minus one to one, then we want the sentiment to be inconclusive, zero. If the positive sentiment are dominant, then we want it to be one. And if the negative sentiment is dominant, then we expect aggregated sentiment to be minus one. Okay, now here is the implementation. We take the median of the VEDA score and the text blob score. If both of them are very positive, they agree with each other, then we set it to one. If both of them are very negative, we set it to minus one. Otherwise, we set it to zero. And in the end, we just return one row of data frame with an additional column sentiment that containing that sentiment score. So far, we have been doing standard test-driven development with 100% test coverage. And the code is absolutely nothing to do with Spark or Fugue. Now, let's write down the entire workflow using Fugue SQL and run on Spark. We filter the sample data by state code and country. And then we apply the compute polarities to compute per tweet uh, VEDA score and text blob score. And then we group by state code and hashtag and apply this compute sentiment function and to get the aggregated sentiment score. In the end, we just get the columns that is useful to us. And here is the result. So how can we make this piece of logic um, unit testable? Again, let's write the requirement first. So according to the filtering logic in this test, this row has invalid state. This row has invalid country. So after filtering, we should keep only the first three rows. And then in the aggregation, as we can see, for CA, we have one positive tweet, one negative tweet. And for WA, we have one positive tweet. So we should expect two rows in output, right? And we should expect the CA sentiment to be inconclusive and Washington's uh, sentiment to be positive. And as you can see, this is a stupid simple test that has nothing to do with Spark or Fugue. Now let's see the implementation. The first, the first approach to implement this run analysis is to directly use Fugue SQL. And here is the only place where you need to have Fugue dependency. What we do is we just modify this original SQL a little bit and to parameterize that and to run it using the given engine. Now let's run it and you see this problem is solved. But the question is why we still don't see Spark. This is because Fugue treats Pandas and Spark as different execution engines, but unifies their behaviors. So the consistency is guaranteed on Fugue level. So you only need to focus on your core logic with small data set and the local execution engine. Your test and your logic can be completely independent from Spark. The function run analysis is skill agnostic and framework agnostic, and it can run on Pandas, Spark, Dask, and all engines Fugue supports. But what if you still want to test this function with Spark? So you can install the PySpark plugin for PyTest and then pass the Spark session as a fixture. As you can see, it's minimal modification. We pass in the Spark session and then we just set the engine to Spark session to tell this function to run everything on Spark instead of on Pandas. And then in the end, output will be a Spark data frame, so we need a two Pandas. And as you can see, the DF is still Pandas data frame because all data conversion is automatic in Fuse. But if you also want to try, you want to use Spark data frame to test the workflow end to end, you can just be explicit at this step. And you never need to change anything inside wrong analysis, your core computing logic. You can also load the entire data set 
using Spark. And then run analysis on this data frame, Spark, native Spark data frame. And of course, this is a bad idea for unit testing because you are running the entire data set in a unit test. This is just to show you how you can integrate your newly created function with your existing Spark pipelines. One last thing, I understand that not everyone is a fan of SQL. So in Fugue, we also have functional interface as another option. Here is how you rewrite the logic. So actually, your Fugue SQL will be translated into the exactly same code you see here. So the two approaches are equivalent. Either way, you get fully tested code that is frame agnostic and scale agnostic. Fugue is open sourced. You can pip install to start using it right away. We are looking for feedbacks and collaborations. Thanks everyone for attending our talk.